Okay, thank you very much, guys. Can you guys hear and see me? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so firstly, I'm just going to go through the lengthy bios of our two speakers today. Really grateful to have these people on board today. So firstly, I'll go through Dr. Simon Fraser, also known as Dr. Coffee, is the producer and host of the Dr. Coffee podcast, South Africa's top locally produced medical podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. He graduated from the University of Witzwatersrands, Witz via the GEMP program in 2021, and is currently completing his community service year at Tipong Hospital in Kerkstorp at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Dr. Fraser is also the founder of the AMPT for the Webbed, a pre-GEMP advice and mentoring group that has provided thousands of aspiring medical students with free summaries, resources, mentorship, and assisted hundreds of students to pass the entrance exam and be accepted to the GEMP graduate program at VET. Dr. Fraser is currently part of the National Executive Committee for Judaism, the, Jun the Junior Doctors Association of South Africa, a subcommittee of the South African Medical Association. For his work on the Dr. Coffee podcast and AMPT for the WAPT, the South Gauteng branch of SAMA awarded Dr. Fraser the Young Colleague Award in 2023. He is a grateful husband, a father of three beautiful young people, a lifelong fan of Arsenal Football Club and a member of Mensa. Dr. Fraser has aspirations to further specialize in orthopedic and trauma surgery in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon Fraser. And then moving on swiftly to Dr. Taz. So Dr. Taz Emerson Thomas is a medical doctor by profession, but a solutionist and health activist at heart. She overcame teenage pregnancy at the tender age of 15 years and pursued her dreams of becoming a medical doctor and single-handedly lifted her family out of poverty. So in her final year of medical school, due to unforeseen circumstances, she found herself incurring debt of 500,000 for her tuition fees. The people of South Africa came together and through the spirit of Ubuntu, raised 550,000 rands for her studies in less than 24 hours, allowing her to graduate, giving rise to the name, the people's doctor, which speaks to the gratitude she has towards the people of South Africa, allowing her to graduate. She went from spearheading an advo advocacy campaign, highlighting the plight of 800 unemployed doctors to being part of a team called MedEast. She's pioneering entrepreneur opportunities for unemployed doctors and sits on the board as the chief operating officer. This is the quote. Leadership is not about power. Leadership is about impact, positive change, and serving others, an ethos she lives by. Super, super happy to have you guys on board today. Two greatly inspirational South Africans really doing great things. Thank you very much. To tender over to you with the questions. Thank you very much. Okay, let me just make sure this is open. Gee, while you're doing that, can I just say what an incredible privilege it is to be joining everyone this evening. And I want to extend a huge thank you to the organizers and to the IA double I A Triple S, almost said double S, I A Triple S for <laughs> putting everything together and for equipping and inspiring uh, a new generation of leaders. And yeah, thank you everyone for availing yourself. We know that you could have been doing many, many other things this evening, but uh, you're here with us tonight. And thank you. I don't know why I got invited to share uh, this stage with someone as awesome as Taz. Um, so I'm just happy to be here. Um, but thank you, <laughs> everyone. Um, thank you for that wonderful intro. I'll try and do justice to that intro, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are so happy to have you. Okay, so I guess the first question from us is, um, no, even before that, can you speak a bit around how Dr. Coffee started? What was, you know, how did you kind of decide, let me do a podcast? Because we didn't really have such a thing as a, like a medical podcast within you know South African context and then um, Dr. Taz for you can you just delve deeper into your story because I think it's such an inspiring one should we should we uh, let ladies go first or are you happy for me to charge on ahead age, age, age before beauty age before beauty I like that okay <laughs> Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, then I'll, I'm happy to go first. Um, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. And uh, let's keep it specific to the Dr. Coffee podcast. Um, so 
people ask why the Dr. Coffee podcast, and that comes down to two things. Number one, no one wants to listen to the, the Simon Fraser podcast because they don't know who Simon Fraser is. And if you Google Simon Fraser, you're mo most likely to find a university in Canada um, or the 11th Lord Lovett from Scotland, which again is like somebody who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's not particularly relevant to our um, and so I wanted it to have a name, something that was a bit ubiquitous that people could get behind and associate themselves with. So that was the first um, uh, concept. But the second thing is that it was kind of harking back to my own roots. So what many people don't know is that I had a whole life before medicine. And medicine is something that I've always wanted to do, but I didn't always get the opportunity to do. And the first job that I had um kind of to fund my my initial early studies in university was to work as a mixologist and barista and basically a, a bartender. Um, so we did mobile coffee bars, we did mixology and cocktail bars. And so coffee and, and you know, the service industry was something ingrained in my DNA. Uh, I went on to, before going into medicine, went into full-time ministry. And it was there again, where in service to... Um, to people and to my community that I was really struck by the life of significance we all actually begins with service. So leadership is service. Leadership is, um, you know, actually trying to do good for others first. Um, it's not trying to be the most important person. So that's where Dr. Coffee came from. I love podcasts and I have enriched my life through podcasts. I've turned my car into my own private university Whenever I have anything more than a 20 minute drive, plug into all sorts of podcasts or audiobooks. And I realized that there was not something specifically relevant to the South African situation. But I listened to a podcast called The Undifferentiated Medical Students from the US. And this guy happened to have the absolute best Twitter handle of all time. Okay, so just for the background. He would talk about what it's like to be a medical student and wants to specialize in all kinds of uh, subspects. And his Twitter handle was the iatroblast, <laughs> the undifferentiated blast that can basically become any speciality within the hospital. And I love that. So I took that concept and applied that to the South African setting. So that's where the Dr. Coffee podcast came from. And through helping other people to get into medicine, there was already an audience prepared. Um, I had developed uh, a reputation of service and trustworthiness, like I'm grateful to say, where I had helped people to get into medicine. And so when I said to people, hey, won't you give this a shout? Won't you give this a punch? Won't you listen to these very first few uh, badly created and produced episodes? Because uh, I have grown over time. <laughs> um, they were very gracious to, to get behind that. Um, and so that's where it came from. But the Dr. Coffee podcast exists to motivate, encourage, equip, and inspire young doctors because we do work in a very stressful situation and we don't always get enough of a pat on the back. Um, we don't always get enough recognition for the long hours. Um, and so, yeah, for people to feel seen, for people to identify with something and to speak to the challenges occupy our late night call conversations and our whatsapp groups basically moving that into a podcast space thank you so much um i really appreciate i'm um, hearing that background and i know everyone else does as well and dr taz can you you know also go further into your story as well yes 100 percent. so thank you so much for that um just just a moment to appreciate simon he's very What's the word? Humble. Um, he didn't quite explain the impact he has. Um, it's not just a podcast. Um, I think it's something that's a lot deeper and the impact he has is so authentic and it touches it touches so many people's lives. I remember when before I even came across Simon, I came across his podcast. And it was so relevant for me. And I came across it when I was in ComServ last year and in Limpopo. And I just felt like I was away from home. I didn't have anyone around me. And I'd plug into his podcast because it felt it felt like home. It was nostalgic. It felt like I was speaking to family or listening to family rather. So 
I just wanted to honor him and say like, he's such an inspiration and I really love his podcast. I love what he stands for. And then when you meet him in person, you cannot not be in awe of the type of person he is. Like his resilience. Oh, I just needed to take a moment before I start on the on the Taz journey. But I just wanted to say like, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, guy. And it's an honor for me to share a stage with someone as awesome as him. But yes, moving along. So yeah, so I grew up in Cape Town. I had no aspirations for becoming a doctor. Like... Uh, no one in my family were degree holders. I didn't see anything besides just growing up in Cape Town. I fell pregnant when I was 15. And then it got cemented that I'm not going anywhere. Like this was, I was designed for doom. That's how I felt. And after I birthed my son, I had a sort of epiphany that even though I didn't think I was worthy of becoming anything, I now needed to become something for my son. And I told my mom, I said, look, I know we don't have the money, but I'm going to become a doctor. Like, and she said, yeah, are you crazy? Like, we don't have the money. How are you going to get, are you going to like do med school? And I said, I'll figure it out. And then I worked in school throughout medical school. And fast forward my final year of, Medical school, I found myself in debt of a half a million rand that only got communicated to me after my final exam. And I was told that I have 24 hours to settle this amount. And I then went to social media and said, yo, guys, this is my story. If you can contribute, please send the money straight to the university. And in less than 24 hours, half a million rand was raised by the people of South Africa. Um and that's why, like I said, that's why I go by the name, the people's doctor. And just through the people's generosity, I felt indebted to the people of South Africa to always be a voice for the people of South Africa, especially in healthcare. So this year I found myself unemployed with 800 other doctors. And if you know anything about me, I'm not someone that sits still. Um, and I then decided, you know what? no news outlet is covering the story, perhaps I should use my platform and allow it to be the news outlet. So I spearheaded an advocacy campaign for two reasons. One, to alert the general public of what was going on. And two, to get the attention of change makers. Fast forward, I'm now part of a team that is pioneering entrepreneurial opportunities for unemployed doctors. And yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. But yes, I'm all about change. I, I physically believe that the only way you can work towards change is if you actually physically take a step towards it. You can't stand and just imagine change. You have to physically be part of the change that you want to see. So yes, that's me. Thank you so much. Um, I I know your story so well just because I was a year under you. And so, you know, when you came out with, you know, um, your story, I think it emboldened so many other people who maybe even felt like shame that they owed money or that they couldn't afford university. And you emboldened a whole, you know, a lot of us to ask for help. So, um, wow. yeah. And I really love that I have both of you here today or that we have both of you here today because you have such different platforms. So it'll be so we're going to have such an interesting, um, engaging discussion. So with, you know, the first formal questions, um, how does one identify their own unique value when defining a personal and or professional brand? You know, I think I'll start with that, T, and um, I want to congratulate Taz from the point of view of spinning what happened to something positive, because it, the temptation was anybody could say, oh, she was given such a handout. You know, people could criticize that she just, she reached out to social media to ask for help. But no, 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 no. Let's, let's also, for people who don't know the backstory, she had a plan in place where somebody was sponsoring her, sponsoring her, and then that person actually dropped her at the last second. So it's not like she was expecting a handout or wanting th something for free. She went in with the expectation and the understanding that somebody was sorting this out for her, 
And little did she know while she was crushing her exams and while she was studying to be the best doctor she can be, this was a problem that was developing the background that she only found out about very, very late. So I'll let Taz speak about how she used that to, and turned that negative experience into good. Um, so just to answer your question in, from my side, how do I identify my own unique kind of value and when I can make a difference? I've to the consultants in a way that some of the junior doctors and medical students haven't for two reasons. Number one, I think because I'm closer to them are. <laughs> That's just the fact. So being you know, 12 years or 13 years older than, than my classmates, um, I did have a little bit more of a worldly uh, worldliness about me, a bit of, uh, you know, education and, 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 you know, experience about the world that I could speak to consultants without feeling intimidated. And number two, just having had enough failure uh, in my life to not be intimidated by by stepping out and risking something for other people's benefits. So that was my my first value was that I learned that I can put together this podcast um, and if it doesn't work after six months, I'll stop it. Um, but I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a go. And I started the Dr. Coffee podcast to help people. Um, my personal motto is helping others live better lives. That's that's what I want people to remember me for. Um, and so that was my my values. I want to help people to be better medical students, to be, be better intern doctors, to be better comserve doctors. And that doesn't mean that I am the best in any of those things. Like, let's be clear. I was not top of my class. I don't think I was even top of, of the row I sat in in med school. Um, I, I'm certainly not the best community service doctor at the hospital that I work at. But... I want to help others to be better and I want to help make a positive difference so that other people can say, sure, you know, like I really feel um, that I was helped by that. Um, in terms of professional brand, I think we live in a economy of attention. So you need to have something that is memorable and it's short and easy enough that it, it's, that, that it shouldn't be difficult to remember people shouldn't be wondering how a word is spelt you know when you when you're looking for the doctor coffee podcast uh it's fairly easy for my fifth grade uh, son to type it to google you know he doesn't need to look for spelling and i think it's little things like that matter you know how you market yourself how you put yourself out there uh, when you're starting to create a brand don't try to do too much um you have a unique place and you need to find that unique place. And my wife said to me, but there's millions of podcasts. And I said, yes, but there's billions of people in the world. So, you know, there might be 10,000 medical podcasts, but there are hundreds, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of medical professionals and junior doctors and medical students in the world. And it's okay if they listen to some of the others. It's okay if somebody buys Nike shoes and Reebok shoes, and Adidas shoes. It's okay if they listen to my podcast, and Behind the Knife, and Curbsiders. That's okay. I'm not trying to corner the market in any way. Um, and I, that has freed me to establish what is comfortable for me, and establish what is my own little niche, and to be who I am, and to recognize what I'm not. I can't speak to so many situations. I can't speak to so many um, crises and and topics and that's why interviewing guests is so important because they can bring a nuance they can bring a perspective and they can bring a background um, into the conversation that I simply cannot so I relish that um, amazing do you want to go ahead Dr. Taz yes so just to add to what Simon has said he's really highlighted the crux of how to identify your own unique value so just to add I think it's important that everyone takes a moment to understand that every individual here right now has a story. Um, and that's the unique value that you have. And I think a lot of us don't realize that it's unique because you live your entire life in shame. You live your entire life being told you're not good enough. You live your entire love, entire life believing that you don't belong. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're male or female, every one of us now has a story to tell where they felt they weren't good enough. 
So I think first you have to do the work inside. And I don't want to sound like a self-help book, but you really, really have to understand who you are first. Once you've understood that, you can appreciate that you haven't necessarily made mistakes. It's just lessons learned. Once you then can understand and appreciate that, now you can take a step back and analyze your life like a story. What's your narrative? And how do you construct your narrative in such a way that people want to listen? So I've spent time cutting out certain things in my life, knowing that that's going to bore someone if I tell them. But the moment I tell you I'm a teenage mom, I have your attention. But it was the same, that's the same story that I lived with, full of shame, full of guilt. And I had to take that, appreciate that that's my lesson. And once I, once I took that and appreciated it for what it was, I now accepted it. And when you meet me, this is my story. You have to be unapologetically yourself. Once you waver and once you second guess yourself, there's no way someone else is going to invest in you. No one's going to follow you. No one's going to want to hear your story because you yourself don't believe in your story. So mm -hmm. to identify your own value, you literally need to identify who you are first. Mm -hmm. After identifying that, construct your narrative. You have, the, you have the story. You don't have to make it up. So you have it, just construct it, plan it. Know how, if someone says, Taz, explain your story in 30 seconds. Have a 30-second version of your story, but also have a two-pager if someone says, give me a bio. Plan, plan it, plan it, plan it. Plan your story. And I think once you actually vocalize your story to someone, it, sometimes, and this is what happened to me, sometimes it takes someone else to tell you what a story. And for some people, they're confident enough to walk in their walk, like to walk in their story and just believe in themselves. I wasn't that kid. I, like I said, I was full of shame. I did a lot of things that a lot of people shouldn't do. And I, didn't belong in the space I found myself in. And that in itself, that in itself was magical. It was no longer, oh, I'm one, I'm one of five colored girls um, in medical school in my year. I'm just filling a quota. No, no, that's not the narrative. You know, I didn't belong there, but I got there. And like I said, before we started this, if I'm going to knock on a door and no one's going to open, best believe I'm going to kick that door down. If I believe this is where I need to go, you're not going to stand between me and my goal. So I think what I'm trying to communicate is you have a story. That is your unique value. Once you believe that, everyone else will believe it as well. But don't expect other people to believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. So yes, that is it for me. <laughs> Taz, I think what you said there is so so good. And if I can just jump in to kind of build upon the platform and and highlight something that you touched on, which is how intentional you need to be about carving that identity and um controlling what you can control, but also letting go of what you can't what you can't. Um and you will probably know this far better than I I uh, have experienced so far. But already, I've seen how the negative voices get amplified. And so mm -hmm. as soon as you start to build any kind of brand, you will become keenly aware of the fact that there are other people who will be like, okay, but you know, can they pick a flaw in you? Can they... Uh, identify something where you might have a weakness because and I'll be I'll be honest with you guys like I have I have tons of flaws like literally right now in my room there's shoes that I haven't picked up off the floor you know <laughs> so while I'm presenting this image in branded scrubs you like, wow the doctor coffee podcast like there's things in my own life that I need to tidy up you know there's mm -hmm. things that I can improve on and there's things that I can shape and I'm still learning and growing and it's okay to own that and it's also mm -hmm. important to 
say, okay, that is not something I'm going to entertain. That is not something that I'm going to let get me down. Uh, as soon as you create an Instagram profile, there will be somebody who fights with you in the comments. You know, there will be somebody who gives you anything less than a five-star rating on the Apple podcast charts. You know, what did I do to deserve a three-star rating? You know, yeah. but why did that person give me four stars and not five? And you can agonize over trying to please all of those people. The reality is you, you can't please everyone. And you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. And somebody might watch one episode, one TikTok, or one uh, reel of, of Taz and then say, okay, that's enough. I don't want to you know, get behind this anymore. With the Dr. Coffee podcast, listen to one episode, and that's fine. You're not yeah. out to chase perfection. I mean, you want, you want excellence, but excellence is not perfection. And you're not going to please everyone. Oh, I love that so much. Maybe I can also add to what you're saying, Simon. And it's very important that you highlight that because I, I know for myself, I grew up being a people's pleaser and a straight A student and you just want to perfect everything and you can't. And you I can't. think once you get, yes, 100%. And once you get consumed with perfection, that's when you spiral. Then you forget about your core values. You forget about the blueprint of your brand and you just, you just sway to the other side. Now you're trying to please one person and your brand is when you sit back and you're like, this is not why I designed this brand because you're trying to please one person. So a hundred, I a hundred percent agree. And I love that you say, if you have a flaw, embrace it. It's okay. And sometimes, and rather what I've realized now, what social media has done is it's allowed us to be human. If, if like for my, like for Taz, I was always labeled as too quirky. I always talk with my hands, like, and people are always like, Taz, why are you so energetic? Um, only to find out last year, I'm a late diagnosed autistic. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. So as opposed to being in denial, and completely stigmatized by being a doctor, but I'm also autistic. Like, what are people going to think of me? I was like, but actually, autism has become my superpower. I can sit in a boardroom with people that are 60 years old that are all monotonous, and I can bring my energy there and change the entire room. So it's very important what you're saying. Know who you are, embrace your flaws, and don't waver. Your brand is yeah. your brand and you're not going to be everyone's cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the reality is that you need to begin the way you mean to go. So in the yeah. beginning, when you have 20 people listening to the, to a podcast or 20 people liking your reels, um, if one person doesn't like it or one person has a different take it feels like the end of the world because five percent of the people who listen to you didn't like it but you have to say okay well i'm not going to change that one person we're going to keep going because i believe in what i'm doing um enough that one day it'll be a hundred thousand people you know and then there's five thousand people you, you still have the same proportion <laughs> of people yes. hating you but the the reality is that you recognize the, the unique uh, place you have and that you're not going to count out to you know to the naysayers or to somebody who doesn't understand or to somebody who wants to take you this way because it also as you achieve a measure of success there are people who try and take you to their purposes yeah. you know um one of the other th things Taz what about helping other people through your brand because uh, and let me kind of frame this and, and I'm sorry T that we've kind of run <laughs> we've run away without you um but the the thing is like, what happens if somebody has a bigger podcast than me? And that's okay. You know, the, mm -hmm. I entered the podcast game when in South Africa, at least, there weren't many competitors, you know, somebody will listen to me and go like, I can do a better job than him. And they are right. And they will do a better job than me. And that's okay. I'm happy to be the pioneer that somebody comes after me and does a better job than me. You also need to be comfortable as you grow in, in your brand that you will ultimately reach a ceiling one day. 100%. See, are you there? Have we... Have yes. we... 
Have we been is... naughty? Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's been so fruitful. I think, you know, definitely what I've gotten from all of this is really just, you know, making sure you know who you are. And I think, <laughs> you know, I do feel a bit of medicine takes that away from you because you're just studying and you at the hospital. So I can attest to that, you know, after graduating, I was like, Oh my goodness, who am I now after graduating? So um, knowing who you are, knowing, you know, what you, what you want to communicate and making sure you craft that story. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, do you know, so do you know what I'm been... really jealous of, T? I'm, I'm jealous of doctors that have like a really catchy name, you know, like Dr. Z, Dr. K, you know, Dr. Mike. Like these are people that you, you follow them and you're like, oh, like how did, how did you be, be associated with one letter of the alphabet? There's only 26, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my name. No one can, like, everyone forgets so or catchy. they find it kind of hard. <laughs> Can I actually add to that, Simon? My my full name is Mumtaz, right? Now imagine trying to say Dr. Mumtaz Emran Thomas. My goodness, like we'll finish tonight. So I <laughs> it was strategic that I said Dr. Taz because it's quick. Um, so that was also brand brand alignment. Yeah, I'd rather be Dr. Simon Fraser. <laughs> Yeah. But the so reality cool. is that that's another little uh, tip or trick to to our audience is that if you are going to build a personal brand, especially in medicine, that you do have that sort of um, professional and, and branding idea behind yourself yeah. because you will practice medicine and your medical license will have your full name and all of that stuff. But if you want to create a brand, you need to identify, like, let's say you're, you're, you've got a long surname, Kiri Kostopoulos or something, that you say, okay, I'm going to be Dr. K. Yes. Yeah, so good. Okay, Ruben, you can go ahead for the next question. Okay, perfect. So with this next question, actually, you guys have already answered some of it. But um, so we'd like to know, how does one remain authentic within the scope of their platform? Mm. Very, Maybe very I'll... simply. Okay. Sorry, no, Jess, Simon. Simon. okay, I'm going to be quick. Very, very simply, do not lie. Because mm. liars will get found out. So if you boast about something or if you fudge the facts a little bit, the internet never forgets. And yeah. there will be somebody out there who will catch you in a lie. And if you try and invent a persona or you try and fake something, um, then you are setting yourself up for disaster because you'll you have to spend half your energy and half your time trying to keep that lie going. It's far, far easier to accept your limitations and to accept your shortcomings um, and to just be humble enough to tell, tell the truth. That's my. I love that. Sorry, I'm just look. I was just looking at the chat. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back now. Um. Yeah. So for me, remaining authentic. I love the don't lie, because I don't know why people think it's easy to lie. I'm like, you are going on a social media platform. And there's thousands of people watching you and you think you can just tell a bogus lie? The internet will catch you out in the next 30 seconds. So yes, I agree. <laughs> don't lie. Definitely don't lie. And just to add, it's important that when you even think of starting a brand, please align your core values. Know what your values are and don't waver. It doesn't matter if Nike comes now or who, ca who comes. If your core values state A, B, C, don't waver. And I think for me, that's what I've done for the longest time. I knew that for me, leadership is serving others. So if I'm going to partner with someone or partner with a brand, that better be their core value as well. And I don't mind. I don't mind distan distancing myself from a brand that doesn't align with my core values. It's okay. Not every opportunity is for you. Understand that. And understand that, or one of, one of my closest friends actually said that you can be gentle and still say no, 
you don't have to be rude. You don't have to burn a bridge. But if it's not for you, it's not. Learn to say no. And I feel that's how you can remain authentic. Know what your core values are and stick to it. And then it doesn't matter if you find yourself at Barra, in Limpopo, or in corporate. You'll still remain authentic in your scope and in your platform. Yes. Yeah. Ruben, I think I, I enjoy the way that you phrase this question about the scope of your platform because you recognize that there are different types of platforms. There's different uh, realms of influence and reach. Um, and we live, as Taz mentioned, in the 21st century in a, a time where the world is incredibly small and you have influence in, in ways that you couldn't have imagined before. But you need to identify what your, your platforms are. So for us, for example, our platform is predominantly, or for me, for example, the platform is predominantly audio podcasts. Um, to make video podcasts or to create Instagram content is a completely different type of platform and requires a whole different set of skill sets and time and things. And, uh, you know, the podcast is mostly available as an audio podcast, but we are on social media and, and Instagram and things. But my own personal private Instagram doesn't even have a thousand people following me. You know, um, so we were invited to attend a large event put together by Philips South Africa. Now, Philips is a global leader in in healthcare, and they on you know if you walk through the hospital, they're probably on every second piece of medical equipment. And Philips had me there as part of the the event that they were organizing, and then they also had some social media uh, influencers and some doctors from Instagram. You know, so we start talking, and one of the young doctors says, "Oh, I've got." 28,000 followers on Instagram. And she asks me casually, like, how many followers do you have? And I said, 800. And she goes, thousand. I'm like, no, 800. And she was kind of like flabbergasted. Like, why are we in the same room? And, and mm. I was just assured in that mm. sense, like I'm an invited guest as well. We just had a different platform, different scope of platform to work on. The podcast has its mm. own bunch of followers and stuff, and that's great. But I'm not a social media influencer. I'm not. I post boring pictures like me and my kids going to the elephant park, you know, because uh, I'm old like that. I'm a dad. <laughs> um, so that's how you remain authentic is to be comfortable to go like, this is where I want to work. I want to work in Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I want to look at the Apple Podcast charts and go, gosh, you know, I have more listeners than Peter Tia this week. And Peter, Peter T is big, you know? So there, yeah. I love that. Can I please just add to that? I don't know, when you said that, like it felt, it made me feel very uncomfortable knowing that someone challenged you like, oh, like, I, I don't know, something about it, that interaction, I can envision it. And, oh, I don't like it. Because That's and why I don't like I could safely yeah. say it wasn't you because you have over a hundred thousand <laughs> followers. <laughs> and I'd never say that. And why I'd never say that is it's for me, it's about impact. For me, it's about quality. The people that listen to your pod podcast are probably CEOs, are probably clinical managers, are people that run hospitals as opposed to that other influencer that has 28,000 followers, but what impact? You know, for me, it's about impact. So I, I, it's, it's a numbers game for a lot of people, not for me. I care nothing about numbers. I started this autism um, series and I got like a few hundred likes because people are like, Tess, what are you talking about? Like, this is not why we're following you. I don't care. It's my platform. And I don't care that only a hundred people are liking my autism, um, my autism series. Out of that hundred, there are moms talking to me now about their kids that got diagnosed with autism, and they're only two years old. They're nonverbal. It's and and sure. me creating the hope, yes, and me creating the hope for parents to look at me and say, you know what. Autism is not the end of the world. It's actually a damn superpower. You just need to know how to navigate the world with us. So listening to you speak, like I said, got a little bit like agitated that someone actually tried to challenge you. But if I can say anything, it's about impact. And I love that you know the impact and the value 
that your podcast adds to people's lives. It's like what I told you, like last year, I had the most oppressive year. It was the worst year for me physically and mentally. And listening to the podcast, I felt reassured, like it's going to be okay. You didn't tell me that personally, but through the authentic conversations and the safe space, I felt like things are going to be okay. So for me, that's impact. When you can change someone else's life, for someone to come and say, Dr. Simon, you changed my life. That is what matters, not the 100,000 followers. So I just wanted to add that. Wow. Thanks, Taz. Your, your check for all these kind words is in the mail. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think then, you know, it, this leads itself to the next question in terms of how do you navigate expectations on what and how to respond to a specific event or topic by your audience? And even then, like, you know, how do you say someone's expecting you to speak on certain things, as you mentioned, how do you not pander to that? Um, and how do you kind of decide when you respond or if you respond or if you don't respond or if you don't, you know, yeah, pander to that expectation, I guess. Sure. I don't know if I can That's maybe start. I maybe perhaps I'm the worst person to ask this question to because I I hate to say this, but I don't listen to my audience that much. Um, okay, now that sounds bad. I don't <laughs> let them. I don't let them dictate what I speak about. They might influence it. But if it doesn't align with my life experience, because that's what my platform is about, I speak on things I've lived. If they ask me, Taz, can you speak about ADHD? I can't. I can perhaps tell you what Google says and what the textbook says, but I focus on things I'm well-versed in and I stick to that. I don't deviate. So many people have come and said, Taz, why don't you start a podcast? I said, me? Why would I do that? Do you understand the work that goes into running your own podcast? I said, why don't, and I, I remember having this conversation with someone and I asked them, do you know what goes into that? It's a different world. And I know that that's not my world. And for, like I said, for me, I don't deviate and I don't ask my audience, oh, what do you want to talk about today? I don't. I talk about what feels real to me and authentic to me in that moment. And if that sparks a different conversation, amazing, let's engage. But yes, that's that's what it is for me. So it says, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I want to kind of pivot on a slightly different view because I, what you said was you can't entertain it too much because you're speaking out of your own experience. Uh, and for me, I'm creating a brand that's not about my own personal experience. Yeah. I've intentionally, intentionally created something that's a shared space um, yeah. for us to also have voices that aren't my own. So I have to listen to my audience. I have to mm. en encourage them to suggest topics and say, hey, would you like us to have a certain guest? Would you like us to talk about something? And to listen to that and get that feedback. Um, otherwise, I'm going to lose the audience because not everyone supports Arsenal. And I can talk about Arsenal forever. <laughs> But that will make for a very, very boring episode if you don't care about Arsenal. Um, so, so you do need to navigate certain expectations. I think that it's important when you have a professional brand um, that you also distinguish yourself or separate yourself from what's you and what's your brand. So, for example, the Dr. Coffee podcast is listened to by thousands of junior doctors and medical students in South Africa who represents different ages, different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different political backgrounds. So I need to be considerate and courteous of all of those different values. And my audience also needs to be considerate of some of those different values. So I, I sometimes will post something on my private platforms, be it on WhatsApp or you know on Instagram, and that's me speaking. That's not Dr. Coffee speaking, yeah. you know? So um, I saw the other day something that made me say like, hey, I have an opinion about this. And somebody, I'm not singling out the the, the incident or, or the person, but the, somebody was like, oh, I can't believe you feel that way. And I was like, well, 
I feel this way. It's not to say that, that everyone has to feel this way. Mm. It's not to say that. And, and, and let, let me just also qualify. It wasn't an extremist or fringe thought either. <laughs> you know, it wasn't wasn't a dangerous political belief. Um, it was just a different viewpoint. And, yeah. and it wasn't, you know, far out there. It's just that in social media, people uh, exist in silos. And so you can yeah. have the, the belief that your way is right. And so when somebody has a, a different view and, uh, you know, as Ruben and T have framed this, this question, there's expectations on you. If you have influence and you have leadership, there are expectations on you and people want you to speak out about certain things. You know, when mm -hmm. the Israel Hamas uh, war broke out, people wanted us to take a stand and we were like, whoa, that's really outside of the scope of what the Dr. Coffee podcast is about. Mm -hmm. We exist to motivate, encourage, inspire and educate junior doctors in South Africa. So while people will have different views about the geopolitical tensions in the world, we are not going to in enter into that. Now, as people, we might have different viewpoints. We might want to say, say something or post something on your, your private channel, but you can't do that as a brand because then you're going to hurt your audience and you're going to hurt yourself. I love that. I love that so much. I just want to add to that. I think what you just highlighted was there's a difference between a personal brand and or rather your personal life and your brand. And yeah. I think for me, it became one. People started looking at Taz, looking at Taz as the brand. So even what you're saying, navigating like strong opinions, you have to realize the expectation that's placed on you now. I can't just fight with someone in my comments anymore. I used to, but I can't do it anymore because <laughs> people will be like, exactly. Now people are like, catch me outside um so now i can't do that anymore anymore because people expect me to act the kind of way and it is important that you decipher are you going to create one brand where it's your personal life and your professional brand in one or are you going to separate it there is pros and cons to both and i didn't have a choice it just became one and now it's so delicate that I have to I have to second guess when I do something now. I can't be like, oh, I'm going to say this on my personal brand and then tomorrow I'm going to post on my profession. It's one platform for me. So I have to really orchestrate what I'm going to say now according to people's expectations. Um, and not that people have physically put expectations on me, but I know it's there. I don't know how to explain yeah. that. Like you feel it. There's a, there's this a level is also of why it's this is also why it's so important as to have your your brand align with your core values because yes. otherwise you're trying to you know you're trying to have this brand which is like an other self and it's hard enough being one person rather than yeah. you know having split personalities 100 percent. so i think it is important that people know that there are two options you can separate it or you can have one like you and I, we have completely different platforms where you have a personal brand and a professional brand and mine's just a personal and professional brand in one. And people have to understand that, like I said, there's a lot that comes with either one of it. And just think about the end goal. What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve a brand that's outside of you and serves a larger group? And I can tell you this, from experience, there's... A brand like yours, right, Dr. Coffee, is more likely to reach an international audience than Dr. Taz, a South African, just a South African doctor. You know what I mean? Like, um, so a lot of so a lot of people will probably disagree, but that's just from a brand perspective. That there's a lot of international appeal when you create a brand that's outside of yourself and can live on its own. So, but yes, it's it's helped me have my professional and personal brand as one, but it won't necessarily help everyone else. So you just have to keep your end goal in mind and just figure it out, figure out what works for you and what doesn't. Okay. 
Okay, thank you so much. So moving over to the next question. Can one social media presence or platform impact one's training opportunities, both positively and negatively? Yes. <laughs> That's a simple answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so like with Simon, with your brand, has it, and I know you're interested in orthopedic surgery, do you think has there been any kind of pushback, resistance against that, or has it just been, you know, positive? And obviously, um, Dr. Taz, with all of the kind of work that you do and the advocacy work you do, how does that, you know, when you step into rooms for different opportunities, how does that impact you? Yeah, see, thanks for refining that question. It really helps to answer it in a meaningful way, a succinct way. So I'll tell you the positive is that I sometimes meet people and they're like, are you Dr. Coffee? Um, you know, and I've even had I've even had seniors who will be like, "Hey, Coffee, come here." Um, so so that is positive and and generally, you know, there's a little bit of yes and good spirits and good naturedness about it. Uh, one embarrassing uh, thing that happened this year is as I started community service, I found out that one of the second year interns had posted on the the intern group. I don't know if you've heard. But we have a medical celebrity amongst us, Aww. and, and you know, shared a link to the podcast and 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 stuff. And I only found this out like two or three weeks later, um, and it was very touching and it was heartwarming. But then I was also like, now I know why people were so intimidated to ask for an orthopedic consult mm. because they thought I was this like big shot celebrity. I'm like literally the orthopedic MO with the phone for the day. Like, yes, how can I help you? Um, what has happened on the negative side is that obviously this is something that takes you away from anything else. You know, that it's something you have to dedicate time to. It's something you have to be intentional about. You know, you have to say, right, when I get home today, instead of spending an hour studying um, for the surgery tomorrow, I'm going to work on the latest episode. And I actually had a, a senior say to me, um, you know, at one point in the year, and he was, he was, you know, he was obviously like interested in his own reasons for saying this. It wasn't necessarily interested in, in my reasons, but he said, um, you really need to focus on the main thing now and, and, and put this aside for a while and, and focus on, on this because, um, you know, this is your career. And that was obviously good advice coming from where he's coming from, but there's no reason why I can't do the podcast and be a conserve doctor. I have had to tone it down. So if you somebody who's listened to the podcast, you'll find that I used to have a weekly episode. It's now more like monthly <laughs> because it's difficult to get uh, studio time. It's difficult to get guests, whereas I used to be in an academic hospital. Now I have to go drive for two hours to find the professors. Um, but it's okay to do both, you know. I recognize that this is conserve and I need to study and all of those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that I have to stop. So they have been positive and negative. Um, and it's okay to find a rhythm. You, there's no no such thing as balance. You just find a rhythm. Uh, and you you sometimes the squeaky oil gets the wheel. So if, uh, if something needs a little bit more attention, you just, you know, you put your time in there. Um, yeah. And maybe just to add to that, on my side, I want people to understand that your social media footprint is quickly becoming your CV. And whether it be on LinkedIn, Instagram, just watch what you put out there and do it intentionally because your potential or your future employers are watching you. And I know yeah. it sounds eerie and weird but it's the truth so to add to that this year I rather during internship and concert I wanted to become a surgeon so badly I thought that's where I was going to go with it but when I found myself unemployed with the 800 doctors I understood very quickly that I had a platform that could make a huge impact in a positive way and perhaps just putting my head down and trying to find a single job for myself wasn't my purpose. So when I used my platform, I used it very intentionally. The, the video I put out that went viral about being unemployed, it was very specific 
I knew what I was doing. I put it out on a Monday morning, knowing that everyone's going to be on their phones Monday morning. So my entire campaign was strategic. And what evolved from that is it got so much attention that ENCA, BBC, CNN, everyone was like, Kaz, let's have a conversation with you. But it wasn't about me. They wanted to know about the crisis. And from that, I then got headhunted and said, and the, the company that I'm with now, the vice president said, come on board and be part of our board. And I would have never in my wildest dreams, I would have never thought that I'd be sitting on a board with legends and as a team pioneering opportunities for doctors that could really change the face of healthcare. And that was all because of social media. That's how they found me. I sit on a board now and I've never given them my CV. So that's the positive of it. When we are in meetings, people are like, oh, the people's doctor, like we see what you're doing. And that's great. The negative part is that it isolates you to only that, to only that opportunity. So people don't reach out to you for other things unless it's about healthcare and activism and autism awareness. So you automatically create your own niche, consciously or subconsciously. You create your own niche and social media highlights that. So don't be surprised when people don't call you up for things that they call your other colleagues up for, um, but yes. So uh, just to allow time for the open floor, um... What kind of, I guess I can couple these questions in, like what challenges have you faced um, in terms of building your brand? And have you guys thought about stepping away from clinical medicine in favor of that brand or because of that brand? Um, I know, you know, Simon yes. with Dr. Coffee, you really want to be an orthopod. And Dr. Taz, you're not... I think you are doing some clinical medicine or not anymore. I'm not too sure. But um, yeah, like, do you think, you know, when does the brand become, okay, I need to take a step back from other things and, you know, what's the challenges you've faced so far mm -hmm. what you've built? So, so when it comes to so the like, Dr. Oh. Coffee podcast, um, sorry, it says, um, let me go ahead. Uh, when it comes to Dr. Coffee podcast, the, the biggest challenge initially is just like the, there's some setup costs. Um, you know, you get you've got to get recording equipment. You got to uh, learn how to do things. It takes you forever to learn how to do a new skill, especially an old dog like this. Um, so, you know, every every new skill that you learn, the hardest part is that first twenty hours. If you can put in a little bit of the, the first twenty hours of learning anything, is the hardest part, and then you start to you start to improve after that. Um, so many people give up after the beginning, you know, because they realize, oh, it costs a little bit of money or, uh, it's just, it's too much time. So you need to put that investment in. I think if you're a young person in your twenties, you, you think that you're busy, but trust me, once you are married with kids, you'll realize that you have had so much time in your twenties. So please, if you are thinking about starting a brand or starting some kind of project, do it as a young person. You, you'll never have this much free time and this little responsibility as you do in your life right now. Um, I wish I had that opportunity, but I'm so grateful that I've had experiences and training opportunities along the way that have led to me be able to do what I'm doing now. You know, So that's the one thing. Um, in terms of your question about is there a point where I would decide to step away uh, from clinical medicine? So as you rightly pointed out, I'm currently very interested in, in pursuing a career in orthopedics. But I tell you what, at the end of a 30-hour call, when I've admitted a dozen patients and I've been in theater and I've been reducing fractures and putting shoulders back in place, the the idea of a nine to five or just interviewing people or just making social media content is very appealing. Uh, when you're very <laughs> tired post call, you're like, gosh, why am I even doing this? Uh, medicine is its own unique um, calling and its own unique adventure. I very much see the Dr. Coffee podcast as a bit of a, 
uh, a cathartic experience, a bit of a creative outlet. Um, it's a bit, a bit of something on the side. But if it ever got to the point where medicine was too hard to do, man, I'd love to do, <laughs> I'd love to do the podcast. Um, I, I have actually chatted to my wife and said, look, if I'm if I'm one of the 800 or so unemployed doctors next year, Taz, um, then I might have to, I might be forced to focus on the podcast, uh, to put bread on the table and pay for school fees and things. Uh, but we'll see, we'll cross that bridge when we get to there. Um, I don't foresee the Dr. Coffee podcast being something that ever takes over, takes me away from clinical medicine. No, I don't. I, I think there's only so long that I'll be able to speak to medical students and junior doctors without being creepy. I think if, if I'm 50 and speaking to medical students, people might be like, hmm, you know, but as a comserve doctor uh, speaking to people who are at my level, or maybe just behind, I think uh, I'm still relevant and hopefully have something to say. Maybe I'll just continue. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Taz. So the challenges that I faced in my brand um, I haven't faced much challenges, um, but one major challenge that I can think of is being pulled in a thousand different directions and not having boundaries. That's my thing. I, I, I always want to help, right? Like I always want to do a talk like if there's a teenage pregnancy prevention campaign i want to be part of it i, I want to do everything but i can't but i want to i just don't know how to say no so i think it's more a personal thing for me that um i'm struggling with that i also feel can affect my brand because people expect me just to show up and i'm like there's only one of me and there's only 24 hours um so that's one of my challenges but to take to come back to this question, I'm actually in this situation right now. So I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to do clinical medicine. And then, like I said, for me, because my personal brand and my professional brand is one, I had to sit down with myself and say, Tess, is it about you and finding a job in government and pursuing your dreams to become a surgeon or is your purpose bigger? Are you going to be at the forefront of helping these doctors get back into medicine and get a job? So now I'm actually in corporate, in inverted commas. So I've taken a break from clinical medicine and I'm solely invested in creating opportunities for unemployed doctors to open their own private practices. And no. I think after, yes, after I feel resolved that I've helped these doctors get opportunities, I think then I will go back into clinical medicine because I love my patients. Um, but I do think it's going to look a bit different. Like, I think I might go into family medicine, not surgery completely different I know but for now my brand has taken over and has separated me from clinical medicine to pursue to pursue a higher purpose in my life yes okay and uh, thank you so much for those you know nuanced answers so um we have some really great questions in the chat so I'm going to let um Ruben take over but quickly I just want to say thank you for saying yes to us we're not saying no <laughs> i know boundaries are good but i'm glad you said thank yes you for having us. us thank you so much to you thank, <laughs> thank you, to you, you and the so rest of the ia triple s team you guys have uh, really created an interesting conversation and i love the questions that are coming through people are asking yeah. some some challenging questions i feel hard pressed mm. to give an answer maybe we could do some justice to them because sure they, these are tough questions <laughs> So we have a question directed at you, Dr. Simon, now. Um, so the, basically it asks, what would your advice be when it comes to, one, balancing the pressures of remaining relevant as a brand and still performing your duties as a clinician? Um, this is with regards to when you said that you moved from um, releasing the podcast every week to now monthly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Ruben, I, I, I see that question, but I also see that my wife asked the question. My wife asked, how do you know when the right time is to outsource your podcast work? And I think that just points to the fact that she's also like nudging me, like, you know, this is something that takes you away <laughs> from, 
from mm -hmm. everything else, from life and from work. Um, I, so if you, if I may, I want to quickly take 10 seconds yes. to answer that question because yes. this might also help somebody else. Um, if you ever get to a point where somebody can answer, can can do a task that you normally do or yeah. answer some need that you normally do, and they can do it at 80 to 85% of how well you do it, it's time to delegate. Oh, you can't amazing. do everything. So, so the reality is that because you're passionate about your brand, you want to make a difference. There, there will never be anyone who does it as well as you, you know, because they just don't believe in it as much as you. But if they can do it 85% as well, you need to delegate. And I've been so blessed that I've had somebody who's actually come on board with the podcast and said, hey, you're in ComServe. I was in ComServe. I know how hard it is. And she's starting to actually put episodes together. And this is no way of saying that she can only do it 80% as good as I am. That's, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's been it's such a relief for me and a release for me to say, oh, wow, Dr. Coffee is bigger than me. And I need to let this go to let somebody else grow in their gifting and somebody else's voice contributes because this is how we all grow together with the podcast. So I see that comment from my wife and uh, I am trying as best as possible to pass on <laughs> the podcast work. Um, uh, Ruben, the, the question that was asked about remaining relevant, um, as I mentioned far, far earlier in the, the discussion, we live in the economy of attention and you need to put stuff out all the time. Um, otherwise, you are going to, to lose your relevance. One thing that's important to remember is that as your audience grows, there will be people who are not familiar with stuff that you did starting out or you know your early days. And so it's also okay to remind people about stuff you've done before. So for example, uh, in the early uh, part of the podcast, I did a, an episode about applying for internships. So where you want to go and do your internship or residency, you know, in South Africa, we do an internship. It's the equivalent of residency. Um, and that is still relevant, even though it's a year old or two year old episode, that's still relevant. And so once you put things out there or you develop concepts or products for the market, you don't need to feel pressed to innovate all the time if you do it well the first time. So that's how you stay relevant is to ensure that your quality is better than your quantity. So I would rather put out 10 excellent episodes this year than 30 mediocre ones. So that's the way that I, I see it is that I'm going to stay more relevant as a brand if people are like, oh, the new Dr. Coffee is out. Then if people are like, oh, another Dr. Coffee's out, okay. That's a very great answer, thank you. So it's basically quality over quantity. Um, so I'll move over to the Google Doc. We sent out a Google Doc and we got a few questions from some of the students all over the world. And this question is directed to you, Dr. Taz. And it goes, I'm currently a second year MBBC, MBBS student from India. I aspire to make a big healthcare brand in future. But as I am a first generation doctor, I really feel lost at times. Please give me the directions as to how I should fulfill my dream of making a world-renowned healthcare brand, how to bring revolutionary changes in healthcare, earn a great revenue, along with working to keep this burning desire in me alive. I need to manage my studies too. Please guide me as to how I should manage all of this. So this might be a very lengthy answer, but... Wow, wow that's a beautiful question. Um, all right, where do we start? I'm also a first generation medical doctor in my family. So I resonate with this very, very closely. I want this medical student to understand that you can be a medical doctor and also pursue entrepreneurship. So you can be an entrepreneur and pursue your dream of creating the best medical brand. However, it's great to have this grand idea, which is attainable, but you need to figure out your why. Like there's this whole thing about knowing your why. And I think as cliche as it sounds, you need to understand why are you creating this revolutionary brand? Why are you not okay with just a brand that will earn 1 million rand a year? Once you understand your why, I think then you can move on to the next step. But you first need to understand why you're doing it. 
And then what is your purpose? Once you can figure out your purpose, I think everything else will follow. I heard something a while ago. It said, currency follows value. So once your value system is in place, once you figured out that I want to create the biggest healthcare brand that will cater to under-resourced communities and make healthcare affordable and accessible, that is my purpose. That's my goal. And your value system is attached to that. For example, the currency will come, the investors will come, the funding will come, you'll make your revenue. But what you cannot do is do the opposite. You can't be so focused on making a hundred million rand a year and then think that the value is going to come afterwards. It's not. So really, if you want to create something sustainable, understand your why, and it needs to be bigger than you. You cannot just want to do it because you want to be rich. Maybe some people can. I just don't see how. You need to get your value system in check and refine it. Use med school to refine your purpose. Refine it, refine it. When you graduate, you need that degree. Okay, you don't need it, but the degree helps you. When you walk into rooms, people speak to you differently. They, they, it's the same person that spoke to you three years ago, but now that you have doctor in front, front of your name, they respect you differently. And it's okay. Use it to, to, use it to your advantage. So understand your purpose, understand your why. And again, currency follows value. Get your value so system. As a, medical degree, a medical degree is a passport to so many things, don't you think? It's, it's your foot into so many rooms. And I love what you're saying about currency follows value it's you just to highlight what i said earlier about when you're young you don't realize how much free time you have when you're in medical school there's a potential to develop so many exciting opportunities but you always have to think about what difference you're going to make what value you're going to offer mm -hmm. you know, the people who built the most successful brands in the world they actually are around very very simple uh, ideas or, or meeting very simple needs so Google started out as a search engine to help people to find internet sites that matter. Amazon started out as a way for you to order books and things to your door. You know, uh, The brands like Nike, Nike came about because a guy used his wife's waffle iron to pour rubber into and come up with better quality running shoes. You know, So the, the reality is as a medical student, you can see you're in the health landscape. You can start to see where these problems are and where the, the touch points are and find a need. And then if you're a young person, you have exciting ways of seeing the world that hasn't, hasn't been channeled through formal corridors of education and you know, structured ways of thinking that you can find solutions that are new and pivot and you're not so specialized. You might have skills in IT or you might have skills in music and you're able to partner those in with, with the need and come up with great ideas. I'm so sorry for speaking over you. I just wanted to jump in there because I felt like no, not at all. we need to encourage these young students. This is somebody who's is a second year student. He's probably looking for that $1 million concept he's going to come mm -hmm. up with rather than find a need and meet it. Yes. And and you're probably going to try 10 things before one thing sticks. 100%. And just to add to what you're saying, Simon, the company that I'm currently part of and the board that I sit on, it was a simple need. It was a simple need that was addressed. Healthcare is not accessible. How do we make it accessible? Oh, let's get a cloud-enabled backpack that is a mobile screening solution that we take into under-resourced communities. It screens up to 10 of the most common diseases and we can just test people anywhere. And while we do that, let's create entrepreneurial opportunities for unemployed doctors. And it's a simple need, two simple need, needs. And exactly that, that's our value system. The money will come, the funding will come, but you cannot, you cannot be focused on the money first um, and then think that your value system is going to catch up with you. So 100%. And I agree, innovative ideas and just thinking outside the box, like med school is literally not the beginning and end of things. 
but it can start you off at an advantage that other people don't have. So don't underestimate that. So focus, get your degree, but also understand that you are, you're not just a doctor. That's just the beginning. That is your foundation that you can start building on and credibility matters. The fact that you have a medical de degree, people trust you. So also understand that the value that it comes with. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for that answer. I wish we had more time. So but in the interest of time, we'll be wrapping it up with one last question um, just for the both of you guys. And so this question is more on the media management side and it goes, since both of you have very unique followers and subscribers in the healthcare space, how have you um, successfully, successfully grown your impact with regard to professional media marketing and how do you keep your communities engaged? And also then, how do you measure the impact? Is it through the number of listeners, through the number of views? Just on the management side, how do you guys actually manage the, the media marketing? Simon? Okay, maybe I'll go. Um, so I don't, I'm really bad at that. So I don't usually check like, oh, how many views do I have? How many followers? My impact is measured by how many doctors can message me and say, yo, Taz, thanks for the locum. Taz, I now have an opportunity because of the, the, the hookup that you um, set up for me. That's how I measure. That's how I measure my impact. It's not about the, st the stats on, on, on Instagram. It's not about how many followers I have on LinkedIn. It's about how many connections can I make that will positively influence the people of South Africa, whether it be our patients or our unemployed doctors. If I get an investor from Ghana, amazing. If I get investors from all over the world, that for me is how I measure my impact. Whether I get 100,000 views, I don't care. What, how's it going to materialize? I think that's what I'm trying to communicate. It needs to materialize in such a tangible way that I can sleep better at night knowing I've helped improve someone else's life. And I know that sounds very cliche, but that's how I've positioned myself when it comes to social media management. And the type of content I put out there is for it's educational and the response and the feedback I get and how it changes people's lives is what matters to me and on a more professional level when I orchestrate a campaign I need to within 24 hours 24 hours has become my 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 thing now within 24 hours if I'm not sitting ne next to an anchor on ENCA I've done it wrong if I'm not being asked, Taz, how are you going to change someone else's life? I'm doing it wrong. And that's how I measure the impact or the social media impact. So um, from my side, I think it's just very important to keep track of your, your insights and to keep track of your, your numbers and things. Um, I have a, a variety of tools. So the podcast, um, production kind of platform that I use does give you insights into how long people are listening for, what sorts of devices they're listening from. So I can tell you that about 65% of my listeners are listening on Apple devices rather than uh, Android, which also tells you that I'm speaking to a certain demographic or socioeconomic uh, status of my listeners. I can tell you that 80% of my listeners are under the age of 35. So I'm speaking to a, a very young audience. And I can tell you that 60% of my listeners are under the age of 28. So, you know, 80 are under the age of 35 and 60 are under the age of 28. I can tell you that I have an even split between male and female, but on Instagram, my audience is predominantly female. Uh, that might be because Instagram is more is used by more women than it is men, um, or it might be because of how our content is produced. I'm exceptionally grateful because I'm not good at Instagram and I'm not good at social media. I'm exceptionally grateful for the input and influence of our social media queen, Dr. Noxon Pambukeli, who joined the team last year. And she came um, in because she just said like, oh, congrats to you and your team. And I was like, what team? Like I'm a one man army. I don't have a social media manager. I don't outsource anything. Like I'm literally 
lie on my lounge carpet, busy putting the finishing touches on an episode at 2 a.m. and then uploading it, and then I go to bed. Um, and she, just because she was like, hey, like, yeah, I want to get involved. Uh, and she had 13,000 followers or, you know, a bit of a, an audience. And that helped to grow the, the podcast. And I think it's also important to grow partnerships, you know. So we've had uh, partnerships mm-hmm. with other up and coming young uh, med school or health uh, you know, brands. So uh, like Club Meds uh, on Instagram. And, you know, as they've come up, we've kind of gone with them. And we're also looking to partner with brands that we believe share certain values. So look out for some new sponsors coming, excuse me, coming around the corner very soon. Um, ultimately, if people are paying um, to be involved in the podcast, you know, if they're paying for that exposure, then you do have to give them those insights. So I do have to tell people like, hey, man, the episode that had you your little advert on got 500 plays this week or whatever. They, they want to know who they're reaching. Um, I am privileged to say that our audience is quite a niche audience. So so the Dr. Coffee podcast is reaching a specific type of person. And I think there's power in that because when you know somebody asks the question, how do you pitch your ideas to investors? In my context, my audience is my product. My audience is what I can pitch to investors. So I can say to them, hey, if you have a very niche product offering that you want to pitch to people and you want to get the ears, the minds, and the hearts of young doctors and medical students in South Africa, there's very few ways to reach that particular niche audience um, outside of my podcast because no one's going to listen to an hour and a half of me talking with the general surgeon about surgery unless they are in that space or interested in that space. Mm-hmm. So, so that's kind of important to keep in mind. I think it's it's important to have those numbers from my point of view. I'm not saying that that's it's not you know that that that's the only way. I know Taz was saying that like for her, she gauges her impact differently. But I need to look at those numbers. I need to see like hmm. I only got 600 plays this week. And last week, I got 1,400 plays. What was different last week? What was different about the social media we put out? What was different about the episode we put out? Because there are episodes where people are like, wow, this was an incredibly impactful episode, but it had one half the plays of some of the others. Because your audience is different. You've got subsets. You know, We did a series called Motherhood in Medicine, which was all about being a young mom in medicine. It got less than half the, the the plays of a typical series, but the feedback was so mm-hmm. encouraging because there were young women who wanted to be moms or who were young moms and were feeling so overwhelmed with the season they were in. And it spoke to their hearts. It spoke to where they were at. They got practical help. And some people were just encouraged like, oh, I can be a mom, you know, because there were people who thought they had to put off that whole aspect of their life because they were pursuing a medical career. So I have rambled on a little bit, but hopefully that gives you some insights into the thinking behind it and why, from my point of view, uh, we do look at some insights and things. I don't have a, a, a an agency. I don't outsource a lot of things. Knox will tell you that I'm an incredible control freak and she's just itching to do more for the podcast. Um, but we're still very small. You know, we, we South Africa's top locally produced medical podcast, but we're incredibly small. And thank you so much for your answers. Um, I really wish we could go on and on and on. I think this has been such a fruitful conversation. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to kind of end it there. I'd like to thank you guys again so much for your time. Um, you know, even we're going to be, we've recorded this. We're going to put this up on our website. And really what you've done today is really just invested in, you know, the future doctors and people who are interested in this part of you know Korea because it's not something you're taught it's not something you're exposed to within medical school so I'm really so grateful for your time and uh Dr. Simon when I see you I'll buy you a coffee buy you lunch <laughs> Dr. Taz if you're in Joburg same thing goes happy to buy you coffee lunch dinner whatever it is um and yeah I'll hand over to Uta to formally close the session Thank you, T. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, T, for allowing me to close in. And thank you, Dr. Taz, and thank you, Dr. Faisal, for well. such a wonderful session. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. So, lots of lessons today. 
never lie, you know what you stand for, never budge from your values. Quality is more important than numbers. Impact is not about the number of followers or the number of plays your reels have. It's about making the smallest and the biggest difference in the lives. Private life is different from your social media life or brand life. It could be the same as well. And beware of a social media footprint and whatnot. The biggest takeaway for me uh, actually came from this part, which said that your values are bigger than your success. It's, it's bigger than your success, both in terms of the process and the outcomes. So with that, I'll close, I'll formally wrap up today's session. Thank you for asking so many beautiful questions. Uh, I'm sad that we could not take them all, but rest assured, we'll definitely try to incorporate into our future sessions we have for this particular uh, PD. Once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. I wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you. We will now leave. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, thank you so, much. so much. Thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Cheers, cheers.